what do you think of organ transplants? Should it be legalized? If so, what do you think of people in India selling their organs? Um, well, some obviously uh, some organ transplants are uh, are legal, and there's a um, huge amount of kidney, um, liver, even heart transplants going on at the moment. Um, the 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 second part of this question, uh, though, does um, point to um, a real problem with this, but uh, I don't think we can go back into the past now because these techniques are there and they're available. That people who who are extremely poor and have um, absolutely no way of of supporting themselves or their families um, can be enticed by large financial rewards to to donate. Uh, their organs, and, and worse than that, there there are cases of kidnapping and people actually having uh, been killed uh, for their organs. So this this is an awful awful thing that's going on um, around the world now. Um, so the first question: is, Should it be legalized? Well, it, it is, as far as I know, legalized already. I'm not sure if there are any particular kinds of organ transplant that are not legal. Um, if so, what do you think of people in India selling their organs? Well, that, that's part of a whole, the whole bigger picture altogether. As you know, it's a question of economic organisation and and uh, grassroots development um, to the extent where where people don't feel that that's a a choice that they need to take or need to make. Um, but if you, I mean, just um, try to imagine yourself if you were. Uh, you had absolutely no money and you had three or four children or even one child who was desperately ill and you needed medicines for them and and you realize if you don't have medicine maybe your child will die and then someone says I'll give you a thousand dollars for your for a kidney or something I think if it was me I'd you know I'd probably consider it, it seemed to make sense so there are these kinds of economic and, and financial um, pressures on people that we, you know, we have to acknowledge and um, hopefully create a, a system where where this kind of thing will will be much reduced. Um, uh, perhaps a, a digression, but uh, you know, a point I think is worth making is that uh, the whole uh, the medical establishment has been uh, very much geared to these very expensive procedures. Um, to extend life or to, uh, to for transplantation certainly um, helped a lot of people. But if we if we look at it in terms of uh, use of resources, um, then you know a small number of extremely expensive machines, uh, which can save a relatively small number of lives through very. Um, you know, uh, very expensive um, technology, um, you know, has to be weighed up to using the same number of resources um, for for dealing with healthcare on a on a on more basic level. And it's just um, sort of a point of discussion. Uh, okay, I've got, I'll leave the Thai question till later in case. Um, When overwhelmed with feelings of anger and frustration, what are some practical strategies that uh, can use to understand or overcome them? Okay, well, um, the, if we look on, on the Buddha's teaching, something I, uh, I repeat um, on regular intervals, but just to make this point once again, that Buddhism is a very unusual or even unique um, religion, very different from the religions that grew up in the Middle East, Islam, Christianity, Judaism. That family of religions uh, have many similarities. They even um, share the same books, what we call the Old Testament in Christianity is also part of the Islamic tradition 
and is um, is center, central to the Judaic tradition. It's called the Torah in, in, in Judaism. So uh, although these religions are always kind of fighting amongst themselves, not very, never been very friendly, um, they, are, they are in fact very closely related. And so in the West, um, the, this becomes this idea that a religion is a belief system and um, and we even call religions faiths, so we talk about the Christian faith and Judaic faith and so on. Buddhism is, by contrast, a very different kind of religion. It's an education system rather than a belief system. And you, just by opening the Bible and opening a, the Tripitaka, the Padraipitok, Patri, you'll just see it's, a, it, it, it's not just a kind of a different kind of the same thing. It's, it's like something else altogether. It just doesn't, the, can't fit the two things together very well at all. So when we look at the Buddha's teachings as overall as an education system, um, we can also notice that it is, um, to use a modern term, a holistic system. That is to say that um, the teachings have to be seen, each teaching has to be seen in context and that um, approaching any, any problem like this, like guilt, uh, uh, anger, frustration and so on, there's not like one special Buddhist teaching or you know what like a magic bullet that you can say yes just apply that that technique and and everything will work out it's not like that um, but there are three three main areas um, that have to be attended to at the same time and the first area is of your conduct and your speech this is what we call sila and then the second area is your emotions, uh, positive and negative emotions. This is the area of samadhi. And then there's a whole area of your understanding, your values, the way you look at things, the way you think about life. This is the area of wisdom. So if you have some real kind of sticky problem or something that's just really kind of chronic um, in particular, any, any strategy that's going to be successful um, there has to, you have to work on all three areas of your life together that you can't uh, so let's say in um, in some religious traditions or something they might really stress the sila and saying and, and have a kind of a reward and punishment system they say okay you should not kill you should not harm if you do uh, you'll be punished like this and after death you'll go to hell or if you're very kind to people and you don't shout at them and you don't hurt people then uh, you'll go to heaven so a lot of the sila systems are reward and punishment systems aren't they but that's not um, what uh, the buddha is teaching at all the buddha is saying that every time you act upon an impulse, whether it's a, a, a positive or a negative impulse, it's an angry impulse or it's a kind impulse, then you feed that, you feed a habit. So every time you act, you feel an angry impulse and you act upon it, you're conditioning your future behavior. It's much more likely that next time the same thing happens, you will act in the same way. So this is how we create our, our lives for ourselves um, by creating these habits and things become automatic because we, we continually react in the same way to the same impulse again and again and again and again. So you create these kind of ruts in your mind and it's that and you just fall into or just um, go straight into that rut again and again. So, you know, from, uh, so we have this word in, in in, in Thai very expressive word key, you know, so if you like if you have an angry impulse and you act upon it uh, often then you become ki grod you are ki moho, ki icha this is, this is the power of habit, this is the the, the kamma so um, the first step is um, to be careful about how you act and how you speak. When you have an angry impulse, um, don't just vent, don't just express it, um, because one, you are feeding that angriness within yourself, and secondly, you're going to cause problems in your relationships with people around you. 
Now I'm sure that all of us have noticed when we're angry, we tend to act and speak in exaggerated ways, ways which if we were really calm and clear in our minds, we wouldn't. And we try, when we're angry, we try to say the thing that's most hurtful. You know, and we can, very, we can be very clever at that. We know people's weak points. And, and, and then we end up saying things that we really don't mean in, in our, when we're in a normal state of mind. 